The Harvest Show is produced by LaCie Broadcasting and is viewer supported by people just like you. Thank you for inviting us into your home today. Pete Summerall with Harold Hazen to share how a safe and secure investment in charitable gift annuities can make a difference in your life while at the same time make a difference for God's work at LaCie Broadcasting. And charitable gift annuities are part gift and part investment. For the right person, they can not only provide a high rate of return, which is guaranteed for life, but also make a significant gift to help spread the gospel through the many life-changing ministries of LaCie Broadcasting. Besides a lifetime fixed income, charitable gift annuities also provide substantial tax savings and benefits. But how do you qualify? If you are age 55 or older and have $10,000 or more to invest, you may be a good candidate for a charitable gift annuity. Both individuals and couples are finding this to be the gift that truly gives back. That's how you can make a difference for LaCie Broadcasting. Find out if the charitable gift annuity is right for you. Contact us today. Watching KWHG TV 14 Honolulu, KWHD TV 14 Hilo, and KWHM TV 21 Wailuku, Hawaii's Ohana TV. people of God, of Hawaii and Honolulu. It's so nice to be home. I took a little breather and went over to see my grandkids and see where they're living and how they're living in their homes and all. And I don't do that very often, but it was a very rewarding time. You see this blue here? This blue this morning has several meanings to me as I brought it onto the table. And by the way, I have a very special guest, our Carol Schmidt, and she's going to be talking the second phase of her testimony. And I think this blue will remind you that this is the second phase of her testimony. Good morning this morning, Carol. Good morning, Phyllis. Good morning. Blue is the color I have heard of faith. And sometimes blue means to us that we're just plain blue. We're in a, a funky feeling. We're just not feeling well. 
spiritually or mentally or physically or something, you know. The blue is a very pretty color. It was one of the colors in the temple. This electric blue in the Old Testament. Maybe some of you today are feeling a little blue and down. And I want to tell you that when you're feeling blue, the Lord is always with you. In fact, I think He's more with us as far as we're concerned than we know. Sometimes when we're blue, we feel like we're all alone and nobody's there. You can't get prayer. You, it's the middle of the night and who would you call? But you know, Jesus is always there. The Holy Spirit Comforter is always there. And God the Father is always there. There are blue periods in our lives, times where you just have to go along and learn how it feels to be a little blue. How would I ever know what other people feel if I didn't have my blue times? So you take those blue times and you make them count. Okay, I was blue, but the Lord came along and by the precious blood of the Lamb, He delivered me out of my blues. All right, so the blues and the reds go together kind of pretty. And it was kind of uh, fun for me to see today that my guest, Carol, had blue on and I hadn't suggested it to her to wear. And I thought of wearing blue. And then I thought I get my little frou-frou, my blue frou, down from my set here and talk to you about being blue. Do you know you can be a minister, you can be in God's work and doing wonderfully and still sometimes you get blue. It means you get a little sad or a little disappointed in something somewhere in your life. Don't let the blues take you over, you guys, all right? And before I get with Carol, which is going to be a wonderful story, which last time it was shown twice on TV, and we got a lot of good comments about your show, Carol. And she's going to pick up where she left off and give you the rest. I just have one more little thing that I might suggest to you. And it was what the Lord spoke to my heart. Watch your step. Did you know that the steps of a good man and good woman are ordered of the Lord? And sometimes we misstep. And when we do, maybe we fall. And I've had a lot of physical missteps where I was looking at something good, but I wasn't watching my, my step and I fell. Now, this is just part of life. And as you get older, you realize, like I'm older, 75, 76, something there, then you realize that you have to watch your step. And I, I take that as not only watching my step where I'm walking, but what I'm saying to people, what I'm saying to those who are out of step with God. They don't understand. For instance, as I was watching my opening, the blue of the water, it said, Prophetess Phyllis Ramia. Many of you probably do not know what a prophetess is. Now, I want to make sure you know, I am not a medium, a fortune teller, a uh, one who gets the word from some place else and prophesies it. My dad was a prophet. My uh, friends, many of my dear lady friends have been prophetesses. And 
I have known prophecy all my life. Hanging with my dad and my mother and going to all of the prophetic meetings and being Pentecostal for a thousand years, I say, it brought me into the prophetic move and my father especially. And my dad was a very sweet prophet. Now prophets, there are plenty of things on TV right now which I see and I look at and they call themselves mediums. Honey, the word of people should always lead you to God, to the Father, to the Son, to the Holy Spirit. If you are prophesying or you are giving a word to people and you take and say, that was all my gift or that's all something that I have, that is not being a prophet of the Lord. Prophecy is a word from the Spirit of God that comes down from the mind of the Lord. His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And the Holy Spirit gives that word to the prophet and the prophet speaks it out to you. And the prophet says that is a word from the Holy Spirit. Anything like fortune telling, mind reading, hypnotism, uh, all of these things that are against God's law in Deuteronomy, those are from unholy spirits. And anything that you take credit for and say, well, I did this, this is all me, this is all my gift, it is not. These words that come, and I even prayerfully say that I'm speaking to you now, are from the dear Holy Spirit of the Father God and the Son, Jesus Christ. And it will always agree with the Word of God. It will always comfort, edify, and exhort, and have love. So I want you to know that there's just so many things out on the horizon. And if you don't watch your step when you are tuning in to the television, you're going to see a lot of mystical stuff taking place, medium stuff taking place, women who can't keep quiet because they've got a message to give. But it isn't a message from the Lord, it's a message from the dead. That's called necromancing and that is not proper in the Word of God to do, is to deliver messages from the dead. Many people I know go to heaven and see God, and see, not they don't see God, but they see the Holy Spirit or they feel the Holy Spirit and angels and Jesus. But the words that you receive from people, you must be very, 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 very careful. And if you go to a prophet, you must go to your pastor and say, who is this prophet or prophetess? Are they of God? And you watch their lifestyle. You watch the way they're in a church. If they are under the authority of a pastor, and I love the idea of submitting to a pastor, that's where your power comes, by being un in authority and under authority and having someone who is there. I, l I love my pastor because he's there for me. And if I get to doing something wrong, he catches me and gives me that idea. Phyllis, perhaps it could be better done this way or that way. So I just wanted to clear that up because I am on TV and it does say prophetess Phyllis Ramia. And all of my books say a woman prophet speaks out or a lady prophet speaks out from Hawaii. Is that pretty clear? Now watch your step and don't be blue, okay? Have faith in God, in God, and I trust in God. I don't trust in you people so much as I trust in the Lord God to lead and to guide my steps. Remember this, the word says, the steps of a good woman or a good man are ordered of God. All right, so our steps are ordered, but sometimes we make a misstep and we fall down and we have to pick ourselves back up again and start all over again. Thank you for listening to my little message. If it's not clear, give me a call, 538-1414, to our lovely, lovely station, KWHE, and I'll talk some more with you.
Good morning, my dear friend. Good morning, Phyllis. You Thank gave you. such a beautiful testimony. I have had so many people call and say how sweet and how wonderful your testimony, including my son, because the testimony is on the YouTube now under Hawaiian Heartlight, by the way. If you want to see her testimony, the first testimony, <laughs> this is going to be the second one. This is going to be part two. Part two. Well, the first one, part one, blew my mind. All I did was just say, here you are, go for it, and you went for it, and you gave a beautiful word from the Lord and a salvation testimony to afterwards, and I loved it. So we're going to pick up where we started because I'm just going to let you go. Okay. And if I stop you, it's because I didn't understand something. I want to know a little more about it. So pick up where you left off now. Okay, that's Yeah, I great. remember you got saved, beautifully saved, and yes. what happened then? Okay, so um, to reiterate a little bit for if people hadn't seen the first part, um, I was on, on Telegraph Avenue in Berkeley, California, and at the end of myself, didn't know what to do, didn't want to live any further, had cried out to God, and the Holy Spirit fell from heaven. God revealed himself as this holy, glorious, wonderful God <laughs> and Savior. And Jesus spoke to me, revealed himself, and we made a trade. He said, if you give me all of yourself, I'll give you all of myself. And I was like, yes, <laughs> take, take me, take me, take me, you know. There had been another enmity, I would call it a, a, a demonic spirit, though, that had talked to you and said, let me in, let me in, let me in. And that was a demonic spirit, yes. an evil spirit. I had a lot of fear in my life. Before I met the Lord, I had a lot of fear. And that spirit had tormented me and was trying to take possession of me. And I had a been able to resist, but I was, I was in some dangerous places. Um, and that didn't resolve until that day when Jesus came. You were at a crossroads where you did not want to live. You were standing in the midst of Telegraph Avenue, and you had done everything. You had been everything, a little of each religion, false foreign religion. You had yes. tried, but and even a little bit of the Lord, but you didn't really know what you had. Yeah, it really wasn't a little bit of the Lord. I had tried to believe in terms of like an intellectual assent to like, and I didn't even know what I was assenting to. It was like, okay, Jesus, I'll be a Jesus freak. But I had no idea what that meant. Mm -hmm. I didn't know the gospel. I didn't know anything. It was just like, I'll believe in this guru or that one or try to you know join this group or something. But, but even that didn't fill the empty spot. Uh, no, because Jesus wasn't in it. It was just me in it. It was me trying to make up a Jesus to try to believe in. And okay. God's real. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> what I was doing wasn't real. Um, so on that, in my previous testimony, you know, I shared of how God had revealed Himself, and that was when I got saved. Um, after that happened, I didn't know what to do with myself. You know, I had been in this ex incredible experience with God, and I was now coming back to understanding I was still standing on Telegraph Avenue and in front of all of these hundreds of people that were walking up and down the street and selling things and this and that. The first thing I did was start grabbing a few people and going, Jesus, he's real, he's alive, and then going, yeah, right, what's, what's, what's happening to her today, you know? Um, it was just so exciting. I wanted people to know who he was. And I ended up back on the campus of Cal Berkeley, which was just a few blocks away from where I was. Which every d religion was bursting out. Yes, there was there was things all around me it was everywhere. Was crazy. It was yeah, it was it was a madhouse in those days. Yeah. Um, and I went up on the campus, and I went to the lower the lower part of the campus um, quad there, where there weren't a lot of people. And I wanted to see a friend who was usually up there on the weekends. Um, and I saw him sitting off by himself. And I didn't understand that because he was usually with a group of people. And I went over by him and sat next to him. And I didn't notice that he acknowledged me. And so after a couple of minutes, I, was, I, I had all of this energy. I didn't know what to do. And so I started to get up when all of a sudden he spoke. And he just said, Carol, sit down. I need to talk to you. And there was like this authority in his voice that I hadn't heard before. And I sat back down, which wasn't my normal um, <laughs> obedience. That's not what I normally did. But I sat back down, and after a couple of minutes, he turned to me, and when he turned to me, the Holy Spirit fell on both of us. Again, that powerful sense of the glorious presence of God. And he said, I've been praying. And I was confused because I didn't hear him say anything, and I didn't only knew, now I lay me down to sleep, and it 
he wasn't going to sleep, so I didn't know what was going on. And then he spoke to me with a word. He spoke what he heard from that God said to him while he was praying, and he said, Carol, you're with the Lord now. You're saved. There's no more fear. You're with him now. And I hadn't said a word to him, but somehow he knew what had happened to me because it was the same God that had spoken to me on the avenue, spoke to him there up on the campus and let him know what was going on. And when he spoke those words, it was like God started drawing up from deep within me the gospel from a little bit of Sunday school in second grade, a little bit in fourth grade, a track that I had taken off of a church. Um, and I remembered the other day that I had read the gospel of Matthew about a month before all of this happened. Um, and God brought all of that together to help me to understand the cross and repentance and Jesus. And it was like, oh, that's what this is all about. You know, this is what it is. And I stopped for a minute and then I just had so much energy again I just stood up and I told my friend I, I've got to go and I started walking off and I just walked through Berkeley I must have walked about a mile and a half or so and I ended up um, at a park and I don't know that park's name today these were in the um, politically rowdy days so it was known either as People's Park or Ho Chi Minh Park depending on who had control of the park at that time um, and I ended up in that park and I went and sat under a tree, and I was just pondering. I was just thinking of all of these things that had happened this day. And it's like, what is this? What's, you know, this is amazing, and what's going on? And my life was changed, and I was happy, but I was, I, I was trying to understand. And the Lord came to me again. And this time it was very different than the first time. The first time he came to me as the Lord of glory, as the triumphant, glorious Christ, um, the king of the universe in his light and his glory. And this time he came, and I didn't see him with my natural eyes, but it was as if he was walking across the park towards me. And ev it was like every step he took, the Holy Spirit got closer, Jesus got closer to me. And he came from what I could see in Isaiah 53 that says he was the man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. You know, and in another part it says that he bore our sins in his own body. And that's what he was showing me. He came across the park towards me and he showed me, the first thing he showed me was that every time that I had cried out for love, every time I had been lonely, every time I had been hurt, every time I had wanted to know God, he had come to me somehow in various ways. Sometimes I would run into a Christian. Sometimes I would find a tract. Sometimes he would speak to me directly. But every time he would come to me, and I would say, you're not love, get out of here. And I would kick him and I would spit on him and I would send him away and I'd say, I don't want that, I don't want that, that's stupid, that's old fashioned, I don't want you, I don't want that, get out of here. You know. And I sat under that tree and realized that I had almost permanently sent away my only joy, my, the only one who truly loved me, the one who could save me. And I broke down sobbing. I was just weeping. I was like, God, forgive me. Forgive me. How, I'm so sorry. I didn't understand. I didn't know. And then he would take another step closer to me. And I would see him in remembrance of the cross and all that he went through before he was on the cross with being scourged and whipped and all of that. And God showed me my sin. God showed me all of my sin and it was hard to see it all in one place and it was there and how every lash of that whip was because of my sin you know it was like lord no i don't want that to happen to you your love your pure your god you're holy i don't want that to happen and yet god showed me that that was exactly what had happened that he had borne the penalty of my sin upon his own body and now I was just sobbing and sobbing and sobbing. It was like, Lord, forgive me. I didn't know. I didn't know. Clean me up. Take care of it. Get rid of it. I don't want that anymore. About two weeks prior to this time, I had started asking people a very strange question, just people in my life, because I felt a weight on my heart about the size of a cannonball. And it felt like a black, heavy cannonball on my heart. I was having trouble breathing. It was so heavy. And I asked people, how do you get rid of this? And they said, get rid of what, Carol? And I said, get rid of this weight, this heaviness. I can't breathe. And they said, oh, 
stop. You know, it's like, what are you talking about? And I didn't know what to do. I was concerned. I didn't know what this was. Well, now we go back to that time there in the park. And as Jesus is drawing closer to me, and as I'm weeping and sobbing and repenting of sin, and I stop to take a deep breath. And when I take that deep breath, when I breathe out, I feel that weight come off of my heart as if it's like black smoke going out of my mouth. That darkness was leaving, the heaviness was leaving, and I realized that not only was Jesus forgiving my sin, but he was, for, he was removing the guilt and the shame of my sin and the weight of that sin that had weighed me down. And I was like, this is, this is way too good. This is so, I, but at the same time, I just started crying more because I couldn't, I couldn't imagine that there was a God who was so gracious, so loving, that would forgive everything that I had done and take the guilt and sh take the shame and take the pain and take the weight and then come in and give his life to me and live with me forever and then give me eternal life on top of that. It was like, this is incredible. The world has to know this. This is the most incredible thing that anyone can possibly know that this is the truth, that this is how much God loves us. And you almost shut him out how many times you oh, threw him away. So many times. And you shut the Lord out. Do you know that there's a lot of people, we've all done that, that you, you shut the Lord out and you don't mean to? They don't know any better. And this way, God literally came to you through his son. Yes. And through the power of the Holy Spirit to show you he was pure love. Yes. And he forgave you. Yes. And then he showed you what your sin had done to him yes. on the cross. And I don't believe people really realize that. I mean, we see it on the movie, The Passion, and it moves us. But do we really know? Yes. what he suffered. But yes. you suffered a lot wandering and wandering around and around and around until you found him. He had already found you. Right. He, he was following you. He knew you. me all along. <laughs> you know, and that's astounding to me that he knew how deep into sin I was. And he still was there saying, Carol, I love you. And even you if know. you said, I don't want you and you're old fashioned and I won't have anything to do with you, he, st he hung around, yes. uh, he stayed around, and you found that he really died for you. Yes. I wish that every man and woman in the world could feel what you felt. That's my prayer also. You know, I think about that a lot. You know, I shared some in my previous part of the testimony. It's like when you heard the first part of my testimony, I didn't go through a sinner's prayer. You know, I didn't know the full gospel. I didn't know my sin and repent of my sin. All I knew was that God was glorious and that he loved me and that he asked for all of me. And I said, yes, <laughs> you know, yes, and yielded myself to him completely. And that's the joy for me because God did come and go through the details in terms of, you know, telling me, showing me my sin and the price that had to be paid. But did he actually speak to you, Carol? Like he does to somebody or he spoke to your heart? He spoke to my heart. On this, yeah. you know, back on the avenue earlier that day, he spoke to me directly. But here, he was speaking to my heart. He was giving me understanding. But it kept getting stronger and stronger as I was sensing him drawing closer and closer to me. But it was that when that ball, that big heavy, that it's that like ball, ball and chain, yeah, yes. <laughs> rolled away. Yeah. You know, it talks about our sins being rolled away you by the blood of the lamb yes. go ahead yes so he he freed me he freed me from the sin he freed me from the guilt and the shame and he freed me from the fear which was tremendous you know i had been a, i had i was just full of fears and god was gracious to free me from that and then completely transform my life in the days and weeks and months and years since how long ago was that carol 37 years Mm -hmm. Feels like yesterday, feels like today, which is, which is good, which a lot of people don't know, yeah. that God is just as real now, you know, that it doesn't have to be something that happened in the past, that God is just available now and just as real. He may not give all the bells and whistles with all that he did with me. He did that for a reason, maybe so that I can share with you today and that you can feel through me what he did. 
but he's still available in the same way and that trade is still there for each one of us that if we yield ourselves completely he will give himself completely and I think that's so important because so often I've seen so many people in the church that pray a sinner's prayer but have no clue of what it means to truly repent and really yield themselves to God. And I get concerned, you know, for people who say, oh yeah, I prayed that prayer, and then they go on with their life and, and think that everything is fine and wonderful and have no sense of God. Well, repent means to turn away from your sin yes. and go the other way and turn away from the drugs and turn away from all those things, those heavy weights. They are heavy weights, the yes. Bible says. They're heavy weights on us that hold us down from the glory of God. I believe everyone is called of God. They just don't know it. They were born into their mother's womb with a purpose and a destiny and yes. a reason, but they haven't found it yet. Yes. And it isn't it. It's they haven't found Jesus yet. Yes. And their sin hardens them from being able to understand who he is, to being able to see him. And that's what's really hard for people to understand. Well, doesn't the word say that we're dead? Yes. We're dead. In we're our trespasses walking and like sins. walking dead. We don't know. We're not alive in Christ yet. Yes. And when he comes in, we are delivered out of the gloom and out of the doom of Satan's kingdom. Yes. That Satan was kind of like our father in the if we didn't have God as our Father. Right. We needed to receive Jesus Christ so that God could be our Father and our, our straight to heaven. Yes. Straight to heaven, heart line, I might say. But we are delivered out of the gloom. You were delivered out of that gloom and that doom and brought into the kingdom of God's own dear Son, yes. Jesus Christ, who bought us with his blood. That's so important. Yes. We're already paid for. He pray, paid a big price and forgave us all of our sins. And sometimes I think we still live in the, the past of our sins that we're not forgiven. The enemy loves to throw onto us, oh, you're just, you're, you're just a pretender. You're, you're not. And he'll throw anything he can to get you away from God, to get you away from God, to get you to thinking that God's mad at you and that he's not there and he's not listening. But he is there by faith. We know the word of God. He is with us all the time, all even the time. when we're not saved. Even. So what happened in your life now? Catch us up. I think God did some amazing things on, on, in the beginning on those days. You know, if someone had told me, you're going to have to give this up or do that, you know, and that's how you become a Christian, that wouldn't have worked for me, you know, because I needed to know who God was and what he was really like. I just didn't need a bunch of rules and regulations, and God knew that. I mean, when he spoke to me earlier on the avenue, he said, Carol, you needed to know I was real. Well, here I am. Believe. It's like, yes, sir, or yes, sir. <laughs> you know, I always salute the wrong way. Um, and God understood that. And... Uh, I had phone numbers of various people in my life that were involved in the sin that I was in. Right after I got saved, every single those, one of those phone numbers was lost. I couldn't find them. And for six months, I couldn't find anyone's phone number of the people that I had been involved with the sin. For. I don't know, including my sisters, but I should, maybe shouldn't say that. But, um, and after six months, I didn't want to see those people anymore. So six, it was like God kept me in a little cocoon and just around church people and so that I could learn and be free and not get caught back up into that stuff. And that's so important, isn't it, Carol? Yes, absolutely. Once you get saved and you find Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you need to walk with others who are saved and find the Lord as Savior. You know, walking with the Lord, talking with the Lord, dealing with the Lord. We're all being cleansed by the blood of the Lamb all the time. That's I don't it. care how old you are. You still have to have the precious blood cleansing you every time you think about it. If you have an evil thought, a vain thought, a imagination. You know, we don't teach the people once they get saved that they need the weapons of the Holy Spirit and the weapon is the blood of Jesus that covers us. Every time we ask him, Lord, forgive me my sin, cover me with the precious blood of Jesus. And it covers and it cleanses us clean and white as a, like a blackboard, there's no sin and, and we're forgiven and we're cleansed. 
and in the name of Jesus. And I learned that the weapons of the Spirit is, Father God, in the name of Jesus, I ask that you forgive me, cleanse me. Father God, in the name of Jesus, I ask, bless my friends, bless me, bless those. Father God, always addressed him as Father with reverence and with love. Yes. Father God, in the name of your precious Son, Jesus, through the power of your Holy Spirit, I ask to forgive me. Father, will you send angels over here? You don't tell God to send the angels. You ask the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, Father God, through your Holy Spirit, will you send angels, ministering angels to this one or that one? We, we, we're not, we hear, yes, to, to ask God, but we don't order him. Yes. There's such a reverence yes. and a respect for God that we have lost, that we just say any old thing at any old time, and it's not edifying, it doesn't bring glory to God. Yes. And we've lost somehow, Carol. Yes. I think we can even go back to what most people know as the Lord's Prayer, but it was the disciples' prayer when they asked Jesus to teach them to pray. And Jesus started off when he said, Our Father, you know, and coming to that place of uh, respect as a father. And he says, Who is in heaven? You know, understanding that he is in glory and we're still here on this earth. And then he said, Holy is your name. And that was how to start, and that's how he taught the disciples to pray. And he said, Forgive those, you know. Yes. Forgive others. Yes. As I have forgiven you. Yes. And somehow we forget. We do forget. That we are to forgive others no matter what. Yes. They do. No matter what they say. I think that is the key to Christianity is forgiving. Yes. If and we hold forgiven. those things in our hearts and we hold on to them so tight and we don't forgive, we just become different people. I don't understand it, but bitterness is poisonous. It gets into you, makes you do crazy things. Bitterness and hurt. And Christians, we, we really, as the Word of God says, don't let there be any root of bitterness in you as it'll cause deep spiritual troubles to you in your heart. And he's talking to Christians. Yes. Christians. It'll ruin a ministry. It'll ruin a marriage. It'll ruin a family. When you hold aught against your brother or your sister, it is so important in the now day, right now. And even if you feel that God has disappointed you, don't hold it against the Lord. Who are we anyway? We're his children, we're his kids, we make mistakes, we forgive others who make mistakes. Love is the greatest weapon I know of yes. in the world. And so I, what happened with you now? I'm sorry I got in there again. No, that's great. You do, it's good, <laughs> it's all, it's good. Um, one thing that I, that I have realized over the years is that when we're born again, all we've known for how many ever years we've walked, whether we receive him as a child or like me when I was 20 or if we're 75 or 76 or 90, however we're still on this earth, that all we've known is walking in the flesh. And once we get born again, we have to learn to walk in the Spirit. And that's why it's so important to be in a good church and around other Christians that are discipling you and teaching you and telling you the truth and, and being in the Word. And they're walking in the Spirit with you. We're trying yes. to walk together. We're trying to fit together. We're trying. We're all different personalities, which I love and God loves. And we're trying to love one another and love on one another. And we do do evil to one another. I don't know why we do. It's our, it's our nature. Right. to find fault and be critical. Yes. But God says he wants his nature of his son to be in us. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, meekness, kindness, goodness, self-control. And if you bump into somebody, what comes out of you? Where, when somebody bumps into you and they do you ought, what is the first thing we do? That's where our Christianity really hits the road. That's where the rubber hits the road. Yes. Is how we react. To other What people. comes out yes. of our heart immediately. And I am saying even, Lord, 
continually cleanse my mouth. You've got me on TV. I want to bring things that edify and glorify the Lord. Is that what we're doing in our lives? Or are we allowing all the trash of the world to come down, fill our minds and our thoughts through television and through different things? And then the first thing we think of, we speak it out without thinking, oh God, does that line up with the word of God? Is that what Jesus would speak? Is that how he would be? We teach our children to be like Jesus and then we're, we act more like the devil. I, I don't understand. Yeah. And Paul says, I am that that I don't want to be and I'm that that I don't want to do, I do. But there is a place of walking and talking in the Lord that I want to try to become like Jesus. Yeah. You too, and, and, but go on. Yes. I'm sorry, I'm feeding off of you today. <laughs> it's good. It's good. <laughs> We're both in agreement. Yes. And so I, I think the thing that's really in my heart, you know, you're talking about relationships within the church and with, as Christians with other in people. In and outside of the church, it doesn't yes. matter. But as, you know, forgiveness with others. And my heart is on another part of that where as young Christians, there's a lot of temptations for people that have been into drugs, have been into sexual sin, been into alcohol, that as young Christians, we need to learn how to walk in the Spirit because God will clean you up and, if, and He will show you what it is to walk in the Spirit. But if you go back to the old people and around the old ways, your flesh is going to come up and go, oh, yay, I get another chance. You know, and it's, you're going to start craving the alcohol and craving the drugs and, you know, wanting to go back into relationships. And then you wonder why God isn't strong enough. God is strong enough. He's strong enough to tell you, get to a good church, get around other Christians, we read the word, pray, sing, worship, come into that place with God and, and give yourself a chance to learn to walk in the Spirit, and then you won't desire the lust of the flesh. It's like the prodigal son. He wanted to go out and do it all, Mom and Dad. I want to do it all. Give me my inheritance now. Then he got stuck. All of his friends left him after his money left him, and he got stuck in the pig pen. Right. Come back to the Father. He came back humbly. Yes. Yeah, and none That's of us are past way. walking into the pig pen again and wallowing around. Right. You Go know? be like a dog returned to the vomit. And that's what happens. That's what the enemy is constantly at us, to bring us to a place where we don't know our own minds. That's why we have to get into the Word of God again and say, this is the Word of the Lord. Yes. If I confess with my mouth and believe in my heart, I shall be saved. And Jesus is the same today, yesterday, today, and forever. He'll always be there if I go to him. He's like the father that took the son in his arms and said, come on back, I love you. Yes. Put the ring on your finger, put the sandals on your feet, come on back. Yes. So many of our precious women are hurting right now. They need the love of a father yes. to say, I forgive you, I forgive you, I forgive you. They don't have the love of maybe a Christian mother or a Christian dad, but to have the love of the Father. And he says, come on, honey, come on back to me. You remember hearing about me in Sunday school where you heard or you read like Auntie Carol did? She read a little here and a little there. I'm still Lord and Savior. I still love you no matter what you've gone through what you've lost of your virtue, how much you have done. I love you, I love you, I love you. And Carol, I find that as a prophetess in the Lord, the greatest thing that a prophet can say to a person from the Lord is, my child, I love you. Yes. And that's what the Lord is trying to say to you today. My child, I love you, no matter how good, how bad you've been. I love you. If your ministry doesn't have that, I ask you, please, when you minister to people, watch how the Holy Spirit will just tune you into saying, I love you, to that young man or that young woman or the, even the older people. The love of God is so rich, so wonderful so cleansing and you felt that when you said i surrender all yes 
it's what, that's what it's all about. Constantly, even though I'm as old as I am, I have to say, Lord, I surrender it all to you. Yes. I don't know everything. Teach me, lead me, guide me step by step. And if I fail, forgive me, pick me up, let me start over again. It's just continually learning and growing and being taught, isn't it? It is. You know, I, I had a sister talk to me recently. Um, she was getting confused because some people were telling her um, that she didn't need to ask Jesus forgiveness anymore, that she just needed to ask people for forgiveness, but just to accept what God did at salvation for her, you know, when she, the day that she received the Lord. And then other people were telling her that she had to repent of every single sin and everything in her life, and if she didn't, she might not be saved. And so she was getting really confused, and God was gracious when we talked and prayed because he brought to my mind the scripture where Jesus was getting to wash um, the apostle Peter's feet. And at first Peter said, no, don't wash my feet, Lord. You know, And Jesus said, if I don't wash your feet, then you have no part in me. And then Peter said, okay, Lord, wash me all over, you know? And then Jesus said to him again, if you've already been cleansed, you just need to wash your feet in order to be completely whole. And God really put those words in my heart to this sister that God has cleansed you and God has forgiven every sin you've you know, committed in the past. He cleanses every sin that we forgive as a Christian. But let's go to him and ask him to wash our feet. We get dirty in this world. Yeah. You know, we get that yeah. dust on there and just say, Lord, I thank you that you forgive me. I ask your forgiveness for what I've done here. And make sure that you go to the other person that you've offended and ask their forgiveness. But don't feel that you have to come and be reborn again again every time you sin because mm -hmm. God's grace is sufficient for us. Carol, when I was a young woman of 13, I was in the latter rain movement with my mother and dad. My dad was a prophet. And I saw in Elam Temple in Oakland, California, all pastors from different denominations coming together. Yes. It was the Catherine Coleman time. And they were on the same stage together. And there was a spirit of humility and love for each other. It didn't matter what doctrine they had, but they had a respect for one another. And I think as we humble ourselves before the Lord and respect one another and esteem each other highly in love for the sake, the work's sake, the work's sake, we've got work here to do. And we need to come together with love, the love of God, and that love will grow and grow and grow because, you see, the Spirit of God just grows in you stronger and stronger every time you have a problem, every time you go through a test. And we're going to be tested. Is that correct? Absolutely. <laughs> and boy, how we go through it. And I found just get in there and go through it and praise God through it like the apostles did when they were thrown into prison. They sat there and they worshiped God and they praised God, and you know what else happened. Everything changed. Everything changed. And that's what happens when you praise God in the situation that you're in. And you realize that you are not alone, ever, ever. And um, when I fell recently again, I just keep falling. And you're talking about but physically falling, physically not falling, falling from the Lord. Yeah. But you keep falling in love with the Lord because he picks you up and he puts you back on your feet and he heals your bruises and your hurts. And you know what? You need a church for that. I want to really make a plug for my church, our church right now. You're hurting. Jesus wants to pick you up. Love on you. Heal your heart, your mind, your soul, your spirit. There's a lot of healing needs to be done. Heal all the wounds of the past. Maybe you've never had those wounds healed. But like the Lord did, he showed you. That was so tremendous, Carol, how he showed you the cross and all the suffering he did for each one of us. Yes. And what else could you add to that that's so important? I think as God, the one thing that he's kept fresh in me is how important it is as a Christian to not go back into the pigsty 
and to walk a holy and righteous life before him. You know, God has showed me early on that the, the church universal on the earth is only as strong as the weakest Christian. You know, that God wants us all to come into that place to draw each other up, that we take each other by the hand and, and walk with him and get stronger and stronger in the spirit. And when the church is strong, it's because each member is strong. In 9-11, when they had the tragedy in New York, all kinds of people came to help. In every single way, they came in to help. Didn't matter if they were Buddhist, it didn't matter who this, whatever they were, and they, it just, just didn't matter. Everybody came to help when there was a need. And this is the way the body of Christ should respond to one another. We're not in here to be against one denomination or another. I think that God was showing me that even when I was a little girl, that we're here for each other for the sake of Jesus Christ. And you know, I've seen so many churches split and different things like that. If the people had gotten together and simply wash each other's feet, Carol, yes. and humble yourself as the Lord did to wash each other's feet, say, I'm sorry, they would have bonded back and the glory of the Lord would have been there and kept the church together as it should have been. I believe we're entering into a new era now, a new thing, a new time, new strength. And the Holy Spirit is there to help you to do whatever God asks you to do. Did you know that? He is there to help you to obey what the Holy Spirit is telling you to do and what God is asking you to do. So we're not left alone. Absolutely. We have we're help through the alone. Word of God, through the people of God through the love of God, through the worship of God, hang out with the Christians who love God. That's what I would say. What would you say? We have about 10 more minutes. What would you say? <laughs> um, there's a, I guess I'll call it a rule of thumb that I've tried to live by for many, many years now. Um, I take it from the scriptures where the Apostle Paul is saying for the older women to teach the younger women. And then he tells to all of us to um, evangelize, to bring people to the Lord, to tell them about Christ. And so I always try to keep this picture in mind that I have at least one person who's older in the Lord than me, who is teaching me and mentoring me and discipling me. And I have at least one person younger in the Lord than me, who needs mentoring and discipling and leading to the Lord. And I keep connected to both of them, you know, and as I'm leading this person to the Lord, I have someone that I can ask questions to and someone who's praying for me and I can encourage that person. And then, and then that person connects to the next one and to the next in one. In that spiritual order, it says to be, obey those who are in authority over you. Yes. And we need to give more honor to those who are wiser in their ages, the pastors and the teachers, those who have been on the earth longer than we have been. Yes. And honor them. In many countries, they honor their older folks. Yes. The, the kids honor their grandparents. We've gone the opposite way, but the Lord will bring us back. Talk to that person out there about how to come to the Lord. We, we only have a few minutes left. I would be delighted. <laughs> That's my greatest joy, I think, is to let people know that they can come to know Him. God is there present right now in your living room, wherever you're watching this, this um, video or this, this live show, that God is there right now saying, I love you. I love you and I long so much to forgive you and to be able to wrap my arms around you and bring you into my kingdom. Just come to me. Jesus is just crying out and saying, come to me. You know, he shows us the cross. He shows us the price that he paid. But he says there's no sin that is so great that he won't forgive it. You know, he says that there's no pit. I, Corey Ten Boom, a dear sister who's with the Lord now, used to say that there's no pit that's so deep that God is not deeper still, that he will reach down and scoop us up and say, I will deliver you out of this. You know, whether your greatest sin is that you yelled at your neighbor or whether it's that you're, whatever you see is the worst sin, if you're an adulteress or an adulterer or, it, you know, addicted to drugs and everything that you can imagine and that you've murdered people and whatever it is from 
what you would consider a small sin to what you would consider a great sin, God considers it taken care of on the cross. God says, I forgive that if you will come to me and let me wash you and let me cleanse you. There is nothing that God, not only will he not forgive and give you eternal life, but there's nothing that he won't deliver you from. You know, there is nothing that as you seek him, he will say, oh, no, you have to stay addicted. You have to stay in this mess. I'm not going to pull, pull you out of that. But God says, come. Everyone who comes, the spirit and the bride say, come. And Jesus says, come to me and I will forgive. We remember the cross that Jesus died on where he paid the penalty of our sin. You know, he paid it. There's no more... There's no more penalty for that. The words that were nailed to the cross when Jesus died says, paid in full. That means the penalty for our sin. That's what hell is all about, is that penalty for sin that can never be satisfied except by the Son of God himself. Because he was sinless, he didn't have to pay for his own sin. But he took your sin upon him that we might be forgiven and freed. And so I ask any of you that are watching you know, if you have never come to the Lord or if you have come to him and, and strayed or have never known what it is to walk completely surrendered to him, that you would pray with me, you know, that you would ask Jesus to come into your life. You know, I'd like to lead them in a prayer if that's all yes. right. I would, I would be delighted to do that to each of you that are listening, to know that this can be your day of salvation and your day of freedom. You can either repeat after me or pray what's in your own heart because God knows exactly what's going on with you. Heavenly Father, I need help. I want a new life. I'm tired. I'm tired and weary of the life that I've been leading. I'm tired of my addictions. I'm tired of my sin. I'm tired of the brokenness and the loneliness and the emptiness in me. Heavenly Father, I ask that you would forgive my sin by the blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus, I know that you died for me. I know that you took my sin upon the cross. And God, I can see that I maybe almost sent you away the same way that Carol did. But I ask that you don't go away, but rather you forgive and you come into my heart and let me be alive. Let me come alive in the spirit that I might love you all the days of my life. God, I surrender to your goodness. I surrender to your mercy. Come Holy Spirit and fill me with your love. Fill me with eternal life and give me your assurance of salvation. And I will walk with you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. If you confess that with your mouth and your heart, it says if we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart, we are saved. We are saved. And we have in a natural or supernatural inheritance, heaven. Beloved, God loves you so much. He gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, go to hell, but have everlasting life. That's what it's all about. I want to see you in heaven. Carol and I want to see you in heaven. Yes. Go find a wonderful church. Come to ours, our LM. Come to Resurrection Life Ministries if you like over in Waipahu. We'd love to see you and love on you. And we have good worship. Just call our number, 538-1414, and let me know, and I'll tell you where to come. But God loves you. We love you. Carol, thank you so much again for a thank beautiful so time much. in the Lord. This has been precious. Thank <laughs> you so much. And we say right now, please stay in faith. Faith is for the blue. Stay in faith. And love the Lord with all of your heart, your mind, your soul, your body, your strength, everything that was, is within me. Right, Carol? Yes. We love the Lord with everything that is within me. And I surrender everything. And watch the peace of God now that passes all understanding <laughs> come into your heart. And the joy. And the joy. And he will answer you, beloved, in some good way. Good things are going to happen in your life. Don't give up. Don't give up. Come into the family of God, the kingdom of God, and remember the apostles, the prophets, the teachers, the evangelists, and the pastors are all working so hard. Pray for them and ask God to bless them. And we just say goodbye now. We love you. May the Lord bless you and keep you and 
make his face to shine upon you. Amen. Now we'll see you again. God bless you. Bye-bye. I'm Dr. Joyce Brothers. Those of us who are independent and live alone shouldn't do so without having emergency protection. And for reliability and peace of mind, I recommend the Alert USA emergency response system. With Alert USA, simply wear our pendant in and around your home. And if you ever fall or otherwise need assistance, just press the button to be connected.